Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Cyclical Investors Club YouTube channel. Uh, this, my name is Corey Kramer. This video is going to be an update on ASML stock ticker ASML, which I covered back in April. Um, but I have some changes, and I noticed a lot of people were watching the video because um, the recent price decline. You can see here it fell 16%. It's down even more today. That's yesterday's move. Um, and I, but I have a new updated buy price for it, so I thought I'd make just a relatively quick update video, <laughs> although I'll probably end up not being quick, um, with the new buy price and, you know, an explanation of how I'm doing it for the people who, uh, maybe this is the first time watching the channel. Um, now normally I only post stocks that are in the S&P 500 for free on YouTube, but I made an exception for ASML because someone asked for it back in April and it was a big enough company. I thought, you know, I'm... I'm feeling generous today. I'll just put this one out there. Um, but normally, if it's a stock that's not in the S&P 500, you can find those requests over on Patreon at the $5 a month tier level. And I also have a $25 a month tier level over there that has a new weekly pick each each week. Uh, that's just the best relative value that I can find in the market um, that week. Um, now, normally, my buy prices are... Um, the best, I, I try to aim for very low prices. So sometimes uh, the critique is that people, you know, that they'll never hit or um, you just have to wait too long or um, I don't have enough ideas that people have. So that weekly um, pick, you know, service is a way to kind of um, kind of counter that if a person is maybe dollar cost averaging, you know, and they have new money coming in all the time. They don't want to sit around on any cash, um, waiting for good deals or better deals, I should say. Um, that weekly pick place is the place for you. And anybody that joins over on Patreon um, and one of the pay tiers gets a big discount if they ever decide to join the full cyclical investors club service on Seeking Alpha. That's where all the spreadsheets and everything are that you'll see me um, use here, which we'll get to in just a second. Okay, as always, this is not individual investing advice; it's just how I analyze stocks. All right, first thing with ASML, it's a deep cyclical business. How do we know that? Well, um, I look at the earnings history, which is the dark green shaded area on the fast graph here. We go back to 2008, nine, we can see earnings went fully negative, fell more than 100, earnings growth went negative. Um, actually, earnings actually went negative. Um, so earnings fell, you know, 100%, more than 100%. It actually was like that in 2003 as well, but the fast graph only goes back 20 years. So we, during the past couple real recessions, the earnings of the stock have been deeply cyclical. Usually my cutoff for that is about if they fall more than 50%. The reason that's important is because it makes it difficult to use earnings as a valuation tool um, when earnings can fall so much and go negative. So if you look at the low here in 2009, the PE was 22, which was basically the same as the PE at the peak back in 2007. I think maybe it was 23. So using a PE wouldn't have told you when was a good price to pay for the stock. Because the earnings can fluctuate so much and they aren't very useful in terms of helping decide when to buy a stock, um, I use historical price patterns because if the, I, my feeling is as long as earnings have recovered and it's truly a cyclical business that goes down and comes back up in a timely manner, then the market will probably treat the stock in a similar way that it has in the past. Um, and so that's what I will use as my guide for where to potentially buy it in the future. Now there's two other things worth noting that I think kind of balance each other out in this case. One thing I always like to check for are super cycles. Um, sometimes cyclical business and non-cyclical business can have these types of super cycles where they just are a bubble, right? In 2000, you might call it a bubble. Um, and one way to kind of look for that is just look at a long-term price chart. They usually jump out at you. But the other, and I use a log version when I, when I actually do that. But another version, a way to do it is to look at the peak earnings. So when earnings are falling, they aren't useful. But if you look at the peak PE, um, and compare it to a past peak PE, then you can say, oh, this peak PE was way bigger or about the same or whatever. So that past peak PE we saw was 23, and this time we're closer to 60, I would say mid-50s, even this double peak here. 
Um, and so it's like more than twice as expensive. So I think you could call that potentially like a super cycle. For me, that's balanced out because I think unlike in 2000 or even 2008, um, I don't think we had had a true secular growth um, phenomenon or pattern. I don't, I don't know if pattern is the right word. Trend is probably the right word. Like a true secular growth trend in demand for semiconductors. Um, but we have had since 2016 for sure. And so what that means is it's likely that the down cycles in earnings for semiconductor, other than maybe Intel, uh, for semiconductor businesses in general, the down cycles are probably not going to be as bad most of the time. Um, and the up cycles are probably going to be bigger. Basically, that just means there's underlying secular growth um, that is going to underpin the cyclicality. So it can be cyclical and secular growth at the same time. And that makes it really hard to try to figure out when to buy them. Um, but I did buy AMD and Micron at this bottom here in 2022. Uh, so I think that we need to be aware that this could be a very deep drawdown because it's coming off a super cycle. If everything aligns, you know, if maybe restrictions on what can go to China are actually put in place and found a way to like enforce them, um, that would be a hit obviously to earnings. And then if we have a recession um, that also puts pressure on demand for the end products of the semicon that the semiconductors go in, that could hurt. And let's say the spend on AI uh, from the Magnificent Seven um, decides to get cut back. Let's say all those could happen at the same time, which is actually <laughs> relatively feasible. Um, you could see a deeper drawdown this time than in the past, right? So, but um, we want to weigh that with the opportunity cost of missing these type of drawdowns right here uh in a secular so i wasn't track i don't think i was tracking these guys during this this particular drawdown period so we have to make a decision to sort of as investors do we want to assume it's going to be a really bad drawdown or do we want to assume it's just going to be kind of a mid-cycle style drawdown like this one was um or something in between so my approach has been if we're talking about the top tier quality semiconductor businesses which i consider these guys as one of those um, I would rather have two buy prices for those. One that maybe tries to capture drawdowns like this one in 2022, and then one that will capture a deeper drawdown um, in the event like a recession or some of these things pile on and or we're coming off the super cycle and they have a really deep drawdown. So in the second buy price, we can always adjust it and change our mind once we get to see what's actually happening during that time. We know it's gonna be scary, we know it's gonna be bad, um, but we'll, we'll be able to make a judgment at that time too. You know, you don't have to lock in completely to it. So that's the setup for, um, for my approach here. And so the way I do it is I uh, go back, I do research, I look at the previous drawdowns. These are gonna be approximate here. So that 2001 drawdown was minus 90%, huge coming off the dot-com bubble. That's possible, right? I mean, if all those three things that I said happen and they're bad enough, definitely a 90% drawdown is absolutely possible. I don't think it's likely, but it's happened before. Even though things have changed. I know we have a secular growth trend. We had secular growth for technology in 2000 as well. So, um, but it got totally, you know, flipped on its head for quite a while. Uh, 2008, draw down about 65% off its highs. Um, and then 2020, about 55%, which again is deeper than the market. Um, and so these are what I use to help kind of guide me along with just, you know, understanding maybe some of the differences now between then, between now and then, right? So the peak price that I have here that happened this summer is $1,100, $1,110.09. And my first buy price, when I look at these drawdowns, especially these two, I say, well, if I buy after a 50% drawdown, that would have got me into both of these, um, to both of these drawdowns. Now this 2020 drawdown might be 2022, actually. I just have these categorized up here. 
Uh, so that's probably the, you know, 2021 to 2022 drawdown. Um, so I, again, I wasn't tracking it, then I didn't have a buy price, but I think 50% is fair. And then if the stock recovers, you have a 100% gain. So you could, you could wait five years for recovery, even if the stock falls farther, as long as it recovers within five years, um, you're going to have a solid 15% kager. Um, and usually the lately these cycles have been going much faster, like two years, but that's a deep enough <clears throat> buy price where you can make good money. You can even make a mistake on 20% of these that you try to do the same um, strategy with, and you're going to come out with really good returns. And sometimes if you get lucky, you come out with great returns. So 50% is that initial buy price. And then I think probably my next one would be about 65. Um, but we'll see like when we get there. So, and I, I probably went over this, a lot of the same stuff in the last video, but so we want 50% of that $1,110 peak price this summer. And that comes out to $555 a share. Stock currently trading at 680. Needs to fall another 18% before it hits the buy price. Now for these type of businesses, I take 1% portfolio weighted positions. Usually they don't fall all by themselves. Um, so it's entirely possible. I saw KLAC was down a lot. Um, it's entirely possible there's four, five, six. It depends on how bad the down cycle is. Um, opportunities in the overall semiconductor space. And so I would rather spread that around in case there's any individual. Well, sometimes you just, well, in the case of the last one, you know, I I barely missed NVIDIA, but I got AMD and, and Micron. So right at the bottom. So it was so close that, you know, you're going to get some sometimes and you're going to miss some. Sometimes you can get a whole bunch right at once. But uh, because these stocks can be very volatile, um, I always like to take smaller position sizes. And then, like I said, I'll be prepared to buy more. So um, that's the approach that I take. If a person wanted to take um, a 2% position and watch fewer stocks, that's fine too. But I, I have over seven, well, not over, I'm almost at 700 stocks I monitor now. And so I'm not gonna miss too much, honestly. Uh, and I'll probably end up buying several more if, if if this one gets down to the buy price. And and so it won't just be the only semiconductor stock that, that I end up picking up. So that's my new updated buy price and strategy and the quickest way I can explain it. <laughs> um, if you found this useful, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button. I have other strategies. This isn't the only one that I use, but this is the one I've been using the longest. I developed this in 20, fit, late 2015, started writing about it in 2016. Um, and it's, I refined it a little bit over the years, but it's been really good to me. Um, and I'm, I've been able to get some really good returns. Uh, but I do have other strategies and definitely, uh, check out the Patreon tiers. Um, even if you just join the free tier, you'll get, make sure you get all these videos so you don't have to rely on YouTube. Um, and I'll see you right later. Bye.